the Democratic Party is in our deepest hole in uh, more than 80 years. Leadership vote, why Democrats in the House are still standing behind Nancy Pelosi. Giving up his empire, why President-elect Trump is handing the reins to his children. Prayers from Pope Francis after Monday's tragic plane crash in Colombia. And Hollywood at the Vatican. Movie director Martin Scorsese meets with the Pope to talk about his new religious historical drama. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, November 30th, 2016. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Ashburn. House Democrats re-elect Nancy Pelosi as their leader, sticking with the status quo despite widespread frustration over the party's direction. Pro-life groups don't like the move, saying Democrats would rather be in the minority than stray from their pro-abortion stance. Capitol Hill reporter Jason Calvi was outside the closed-door vote and caught up with lawmakers. Jason. Lauren, Pelosi defeated her competitor, Ohio Representative Tim Ryan, a seven-term congressman. The vote total, 134 to 63, but that's the largest defection against Pelosi since she first became minority leader back in 2002. Behind these closed doors, House Democrats picked Pelosi with a secret ballot. 63 lawmakers, or a third of all House Democrats, supported her opponent, Tim Ryan. Ryan used to be pro-life, but now says he's pro-choice. He reaffirmed that position to me today. Democrats have moved left on abortion for decades. This year, their platform called for the repeal of the Hyde Amendment, which bans taxpayer funds for abortion. Pelosi supporters say she was their best bet to fight President Donald Trump. But some House Democrats didn't hide their disappointment. The talk about getting rid of the Hyde Amendment, uh, I think, was really hurts the Democratic Party in, in this election. Uh, and I think there needs to be a change within the party uh, because I don't think we can be a majority party in the House unless we are clear that we welcome pro-life Democrats. And I can continue to fight for that. You know, the Democratic Party has been somewhat narrow and elitist lately, and uh, that's not our natural uh, position. So Democrats have complained, some Democrats have complained that they were shut out of leadership. So Nancy Pelosi is promising changes, including bringing on a freshman member of the House onto the leadership team. But because of Ryan's loss tonight, Lauren, no new blood at the very top. Jason, what else did Ryan, the Pelosi challenger, tell you? Well, I asked him if the Democratic Party needed to make a move to become more conservative on social issues, including the Hyde Amendment, which bans taxpayer funding for abortion. He said he didn't want to get into the specifics of policy, but he said all people, including pro-lifers, should be welcome in the party. Okay, Jason Calvi, thank you very much. Reporting from the Capitol. And Donald Trump is hitting the road again. He's speaking at the Carrier Air Conditioning Plant in Indianapolis tomorrow. He'll celebrate the company's decision to keep nearly 1,000 jobs in Indiana. Then he's off on his thank you tour, starting with a visit to Cincinnati. Meanwhile, he continues to charge ahead in assembling his cabinet. I've had a, uh, a wonderful evening with uh, President-elect Trump. Uh, we had another discussion about uh, affairs throughout the world. Donald Trump's dinner companion last night is still in the race for Secretary of State. Mr. President, like, we're looking at the next Secretary of State right here. Well, we're going to see what happens. Along with three others, including former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani. He, unlike Romney, was a vocal positive surrogate during the election. Two others are under wraps. Newly announced nominees include billionaire and former bankruptcy advisor Wilbur Ross for Commerce Secretary and former Goldman Sachs banker Steve Nunchin for Treasury. He has big plans for cutting taxes. The tax plan has both the corporate aspects to it, lowering corporate taxes so we make U.S. companies the most competitive in the world, and the personal income taxes, where we're going to have the most significant middle income tax cut since Reagan. Of the 16 positions that require Senate approval, Trump has picked eight, including Attorney General Jeff Sessions. He has nine to go. Donald Trump says he's giving up his business empire. He tweeted he's holding a press conference December 15th with his children.
to talk about handing it off. And Vice President-elect Mike Pence is on Capitol Hill today talking with GOP lawmakers. He met with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. And he then went over onto the House side to sit down with Speaker Paul Ryan. The president-elect and Congress both say they want to repair crumbling infrastructure. The transportation secretary is going to play a critical role in deciding where those dollars are spent. It could be in Elaine Chao's hands if her nomination is confirmed by the Senate. Many challenges lie ahead from rebuilding our highway system to restoring crumbling bridges, including this one, the Arlington Memorial Bridge, which spans the Potomac and links to the Lincoln Memorial and Arlington National Cemetery. James Burnley, former Transportation Secretary in the Reagan administration, joins us from his Washington, D.C. law office. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. If confirmed, Chow would be the second woman to hold two secretary positions, who was also married to the Senate Majority Leader. I won't quiz you, Elizabeth Dole was the other one. Now, when Chow was the George Bush's labor secretary, she built this reputation as being really tough on unions. Do you think that's going to hurt her? I don't think so. I, I think, by definition, uh, labor secretaries and Republican administrations displease unions overall. and. Uh, labor secretaries and Democratic administrations displease business overall. It's just in the nature of the difference of the two parties mm -hmm. and their political basis. What do you think is going to be her biggest challenge? First, she's got to work with the new president, uh, President Trump, and his White House and the Republicans in Congress as well as the Democrats in trying to fashion a consensus on a major infrastructure program to rebuild our roads, airports, transit systems, and ports. And then she will also, I think, need to focus on reform of the air traffic control system, uh, which is a proposal that particularly in the House uh, there's been a lot of work on already. Right. And then the other area will be autom automation, which is overtaking us in transportation in two particular areas. One are autonomous vehicles on our roads. And the developments there, is, as you know, are moving very rapidly. And uh, there will be, there already is a role for DOT. There will be a continuing role there, as well as uh, with respect to drones in the skies. Sure. Where we've had an explosion in the number of drones that are out there. And the FAA is, is struggling to make sure that, as they always do, first and foremost, we keep our skies safe. So yes. And I think in those three areas, she'll have a lot to do. And uh, no, I need to get those Amazon packages to my door. So I'm hoping she'll she'll be working yeah, on that. Yeah, maybe a few years, Warren. <laughs> right. Maybe a few years, but but that's probably coming too. Yeah, she's married to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Is that a is that relationship an advantage or a disadvantage in working with Congress? Oh I, well, I'm sure it's an advantage. And and since I was Deputy Secretary when when Elizabeth Dole was Secretary, and and Bob Dole became the Republican leader during her tenure at DOT, I've had a chance to observe how that works. And believe me, it's advantageous. James Burnley, former Secretary of Transportation in the Reagan administration. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. At least five people are dead and dozens injured after strong storms and possible tornadoes ripped through parts of Alabama and Tennessee. A suspected twister hit northern Alabama and the town of Rosalie, killing three people at a mobile home park. Strong rain and hail also hit Louisiana and Mississippi. Britain's senior commander in Iraq and Syria says he's confident coalition forces will defeat ISIS. Major General Rupert Jones spoke out today about the terror group. Wyatt Goldsby was there. He is now reporting from the Pentagon. Wyatt. Lauren, Major General Jones says Iraqi forces are making progress in the fight to retake Mosul, the country's second largest city, but he's also calling for patience. He says liberating Mosul has not been easy and it's going to take a long time to fully rid ISIS from the city. General Jones laid out the challenges facing coalition forces in a video conference to the Pentagon from Baghdad. He said ISIS is using IEDs and car bombs to try and slow the offensive. Iraqi special forces are currently held up on the east side of the city, so they're trying to capture strategic hilltop positions to the south. 
During today's briefing, I asked General Jones about the issue of Christians being driven from their ancient homeland. There are many groups of Christians who are afraid to return to their homes, whether it's in Mosul or other parts of Iraq. Is there anything militarily that the coalition is doing specifically to protect religious minorities? I'm confident that the government of Iraq uh, takes absolute due account of the requirements of minorities. I know the humanitarian organizations do as well. And I know that the government of Iraq has thought very carefully uh, about those minorities and making sure that there's no, uh, if you like, change to the ethnic balance in the, in the Mosul area. But I think from uh, us in the military, uh, our absolute requirement and the requirement of the Iraqi security forces is to uh, protect all civilians. Groups like In Defense of Christians have called on the military to do more to protect religious minorities and their property. They say many Christians don't feel like there is enough of an effort to protect them from ISIS, who the State Department says is committing genocide against Christians. UNICEF says nearly half of the families in Mosul have lost access to clean water as a result of a major pipeline that was destroyed during the fighting. Lauren? Wyatt, when you were in that briefing room and you were talking to people, what were you hearing that morale is like among the Iraqi forces? Well, certainly it's much better than it was or appears to be much better than it was even a year ago. Within the last month, the Iraqi forces have been taking back a number of small towns on the outskirts of Mosul and pushing back ISIS. And that's really given them a lot of confidence. In fact, one of the Iraqi generals has said that ISIS in his country is on its last breath. Lauren? Well, I think many people are hoping that that is true. Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the Pentagon. Thank you, Wyatt. The ashes of Fidel Castro begin a four-day journey across Cuba, retracing the path of his march into Havana nearly 60 years ago. Thousands of Cubans lined the streets today as a green military jeep carrying the former president's ashes was moving. President the procession route is more than 500 miles and will go and, and will end in Santiago, his final resting place. The former ruler died on Friday. He was 90. Dr. Gracie Christie, a policy advisor with the Catholic Association, joins us from Miami. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Five decades ago during the revolution, Castro triggered the repression of Catholics and he closed churches. What is the state of the church today in Cuba? Well, now from um, almost 100% Catholic country, uh, Cubans call themselves 65% Catholic. But of those people, very, very few practice their faith going to church on a weekly basis or even ever at all. Is that, that because, is because they're afraid? Is that because they're afraid? There have been decades of suppression, um, very cruel suppression of the church, such as we've seen in other communist countries. Um, it's, it's the communist ideology is strictly atheist. It's only been um, since the Pope visited the island recently, Pope Francis, that people uh, are allowed to join the Communist Party if they say that they are Catholics, if they are practicing Catholics. Many people, many Cuban Americans and Cuban people have waited for this moment of Castro's death. Now, what I want to know is what's going to happen next? Now that he's gone, what happens to the church? Well, the church, this is an opportunity for all of Cuba, the death of this dictator that has had this psychological power over the Cuban people for so many decades, and also over the church and the way the church can help the people of Cuba. Um, it's really up to the dictatorship because they still have 100% control over all of uh, everything that goes on in Cuba. So we need to pray a lot, and I hope that our, our country, the United States, can go forward demanding concessions from the government, such as religious liberty in Cuba. Castro's death, it seems to me, has opened the eyes of American Catholics to this degree of religious repression in Cuba. Would you agree with that? I hope it has. Um, you know, as, as people who understand what goes on in Cuba, we're close to it. We're, we're often very shocked at the amount of romanticism that Americans, um, that's the way they think romantically about Cuba. But the fact is, is that People there live under terrible conditions of oppression. And one of the things that the dictatorship has taken from them is the joy and the hopefulness that comes from people who know that they are children of God. So when we I, need to keep that in mind. Right. When I was in Cuba earlier this year, I saw this beautiful, iconic Jesus statue that looks over Havana Bay. Why would he keep that statue? You know, he was a cruel and spiteful man. Um, I thought about that, and I think it might have been to show the Cuban people the extent of his power over them, that he had been able to take one of their greatest joys from them and one of the things that makes them most 
human, which is their religion. Okay. So I hope that that statue will remind all Cubans that maybe now is a moment to ask for more from their cruel government. Dr. Gracie Christie, policy advisor with the Catholic Association, thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you. Coming up, inside information. Representative Marsha Blackburn tells us what she talked about with President-elect Donald Trump. And our report from Rome, Pope Francis gives thoughts on the works of mercy. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Representative Marsha Blackburn is a key figure in Donald Trump's transition team. She met with him yesterday, and today Capitol Hill reporter Jason Calvi asked her what she discussed. So yesterday the president-elect promoted you to vice chair of the transition team. Did he also offer you a position in his administration? No, he and I had a great visit and we talked about uh, different positions. We talked about how, how I continue to work to help him to get the job done, to do more with less. And we'll see, this is all his story to tell, it's not mine. So no, so no news to share? No right news now. to share. What did you talk about with the president-elect? We talk about the way forward and how you go about right-sizing the federal government, the different departments, uh, what needs to be done in those different departments to be certain that we reduce the size, the scope, and the cost of, of uh, the federal government. People are tired of calling different agencies and can't get a, an answer or having the EPA or OSHA show up at your manufacturing plant and saying, I'm here to fine you. Uh, you know, this is just ridiculous. And so people are ready for that to change. That's what they voted for. And look at what happened with Carrier in Indiana. Yes. He's making a he's big news. Already, he's already causing things to be done differently. You can look at Ford, you can look at Carrier, you can look at the mindset of American business, that this is somebody who is going to work with them. This is not someone who's coming to the table saying, I'm going to punish you. You're chairing the investigation into abortion, fetal tissue donation. Did you talk about that with the president? I did yesterday? not. I did not. His uh, staff is fully aware of what we have done, and they're fully aware that we are completing our investigation. We'll have recommendations and a final report before we're sworn in for the next Congress on January 3rd. So you have a few more weeks. Are you making progress? Can you share one thing that you're preparing yes, to reveal? Yes, we are, we are preparing uh, to mark up our depositions we're preparing to write, we're in the process of writing that final report and it's going to be available to the public. We'll have it, we'll present it to the speaker before January 3rd. And tell, tell me about the HHS nomination of Representative Price. Is that a good news Thrilled. for pro-lifers? It is a very good news for pro-lifers. Right. He is solidly pro-life. He will uphold the Hyde Amendment. He will be very prescriptive in how he goes about addressing uh, the changes that need to transpire in health care so that we preserve access to affordable health care for all Americans. So any, any other insights into the pro-life cause moving forward in the first 100 days of the Trump administration, defunding Planned Parenthood, for example, maybe not being attached to the, I, I to the repeal that, of Obamacare? You know, we need to look at defunding um, abortion services, making certain that there is that line between women's health and abortion services. And I think we would be well served to make that our focus. Do you think he's going to make that a focus of the first 100 days? I, I think you'll see some uh, movement. Uh, that direction and I'm very pleased that we have a pro-life president, that we have a pro-life secretary of HHS. It will serve us well. Thank you so much, Representative Thank you. Marcia Blackburn of Tennessee. Thank you. Pope Francis prays for the victims of Monday's deadly plane crash in Colombia. The Holy Father urged people at his weekly gathering with pilgrims and tourists to pray for everyone involved. 71 people on board the plane, including members of a Brazilian soccer team, died. Six people survived. Alan Holdren is the Rome Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. Holy Year of Mercy may be over, but the Pope now is encouraging the faithful to continue to practice compassion and acts of mercy, not always on top of our mind. How is he, how is he doing that? 
Well, he says that we can continue to uh, practice these uh, works of mercy in our daily lives. Uh, he was speaking specifically about uh, praying for the living and the dead and burying the dead today. Uh, but this is on the heels of months of these catecheses, these weekly addresses that he gives at the general audience, where he's speaking about how to put these works of mercy into practice, how to show God's mercy so that we can continue to do that uh, even though this year of mercy is over. Um, he said his catechesis are also over, but uh, mercy must go on. Well, this was the month, as you said, dedicated to praying for the dead, but he's also saying, okay, let's also pray for the living. And did he give any, anything concrete? That's what I'm, I'm looking for, anything concrete. Yeah, uh, Lauren, he talked about uh, specific ways of praying for others, like uh, say uh, parents pray for their children. He said that parents often bless their children in the morning and in the evening. He's spoken about that before. He says that it's a great way to, to teach your children prayer and pray for your children. Um, he also spoke about a man who went to his morning mass yesterday at the guest house that the Pope calls home. Uh, he said this man came in. Uh, really was crying about the fact that his business is failing. He's going to be leaving 50 families uh, without jobs, uh, without a possibility to, to bring home wages. Uh, and he was really distressed about this. The Pope said this is a, a great example of someone really caring about their neighbor. Uh, he said that he could just take home a bankruptcy settlement, uh, but that would only be for himself. He couldn't do that. He said his heart would cry for those people that he's in charge of. Uh, this is an example that the Pope gave. Thank you so much, Alan Holdren, with our sister organization, Catholic News Agency. Thank you, Lauren. Also at the Vatican, a little piece of Hollywood visits the Pope. Director Martin Scorsese met with the Holy Father this morning. His new film, Silence, premiered this week at the Vatican. It focuses on the persecution of Jesuit missionaries in 17th century Japan. Pope Francis told Scorsese he's read the novel on which the film is based. The Pope gave the director and his family rosaries. Up next, artificial intelligence at the Vatican. Medical and tech experts talk about how humans fit into a growing digital environment. And on this feast of St. Andrew, two art pieces representing his discipleship. celebrate the feast of St. Andrew the Apostle and how he's portrayed in art. Dr. Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith, joins us now. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Lauren. You know, this is say, about St. Andrew and the first piece that we're going to look at from the National Gallery of Art doesn't seem very colorful, but it does have the typical St. Andrew cross in it. Could you tell right. us about that? Right. St. Andrew and his brother Peter uh, were disciples chosen by Jesus. They were both fishermen and Jesus chooses them to go forth and preach the gospel. And so we know from tradition that St. Andrew travels to Greece to spread the faith there. And uh, for his bold preaching of the gospel, he is put to death on a cross. And that is the moment that we see in this beautiful pen and ink drawing from the National Gallery, uh, where St. Andrew is kneeling before his persecutors as he is about to be martyred. It is believed that St. Andrew was tied, not nailed to the cross, uh, to prolong his suffering. And so he was on the cross for several days and continued preaching to the people who had gathered around this beloved disciple. Now, he was a native of, of Galilee, and it looks like in this next picture, 600 years old, and, in, and there are very important people in here, including Madonna. What's the connection between St. Andrew and Madonna? As you said, at the center of the composition is the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Christ Child with the scene of the Annunciation above them. The entire altarpiece really evokes in radiant colors and shimmering gold, this beautiful sense in which the St. Andrew is part of the heavenly realm. Wonderful. He's part of that heavenly realm where Mary, the angels, the saints join in that eternal hymn of praise to God. Thank you so much. Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The Vatican kicks off a two-day conference on the ethics of artificial intelligence or computers making human-like decisions. The Pontifical Academy of Sciences brought together experts in medicine, psychology, and technology, including representatives from Facebook and Google. The Vatican wants to make sure the human person remains at the center of our growing digital environment. 
as a society we need to think very carefully about the ethical use of these technologies and as one of the developers of this kind of artificial intelligence technology we want we want to be at the forefront of thinking about how to use it responsibly for the good of everyone in the world we need uh, people to be able to interact naturally with machines and we also think that artificial intelligence would be a, a crucial key technology to facilitate communication between people Artificial intelligence can expand our human capacities, but also threatens to replace them. That's why leading tech giants are considering the ethical implications. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Lauren Ashburn. Thank you for watching. Good night and God bless.